warm greetings on behalf of Friday Waters and initiative of the W for W Foundation, a think tank built as Citizens Collective. We welcome you to today's session. Today's uh, session is basically on water arts and Friday Waters is a continuum of the signature series Wednesdays for Water. The activities in the Friday Water series includes Water Talkies, Water Reading Club, Water Thesis Club and Water Arts. Each of these sessions takes place once a month. And today we have Water Arts as today's session. The idea of Friday Water Arts is to bring water knowledge available in various alternate forms at one place to highlight the opportunities and challenges related to water. The idea is to also increase the outreach of alternate water practices in the water networks as well as in the society at large. The Friday water sessions are designed to be fun filled and yet fruitful to learn more about the water matters. Do keep following us at www.w4w.in for regular updates. My name is Mansi Bal Bhargav and I am the host for W4W today and today's session is actually co-hosted by Living Waters Museum and the session will be moderated by Supreet Sain, who has been our speaker in previous Wednesdays as well as Friday Water session. Supreet is a heritage and disaster management manager by profession and a musician by passion. He is also leading the Kolkata chapter of Arts and Outreach for Living Waters Museum, and he's also a research associate at Ikram Rome. So I will hand it over to Sukrit to take the session forward and thank you Living Waters Museum, all the team members there to take this responsibility of hosting water arts with us. Over to you Sukrit. Thank you so much. Hi from the Living Waters Museum. Today um, is the water arts session on visual art and water. The focus of water arts is on bringing the artists who have associated their art forms with different attributes of water. Conversations around water may have gotten very scientific and somehow I feel that these conversations have been restricted to certain categories of the society only. This is where art plays a vital role in enlarging the circle of our audiences alongside the promotion of the art form as well. This is why we from the Living Waters Museum have always tried to find more innovative and creative ways to start conversations around rather heavy current affairs. And I'm glad more people are slowly recognizing this and relooking at the role of art and artists in scientific discourses. I'm joined by Dr. Sarah Ahmed from the Living Waters Museum as a discussion for today's water art session. And we have Ms. Michelle Boyle as a guest speaker who is a Cavan Ireland based artist. Sarah Ahmed is the founder uh, director of the Living Waters Museum and an adjunct professor at the Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research in Pune, India. In 2017, Sara launched the Living Waters Museum, a virtual repository on water heritage. She has been an adjunct professor at Ahmedabad University and currently serves on the board of Water Aid India, Wetlands International South Asia and the Global Network of Water Museum. May I now hand it over to Sara to take the session further with Michelle. Over to you, Sarah, and thank you all for joining. Hi, everyone. Good to see some friends online. So thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure to introduce Michelle. I've been introduced to Michelle by a mutual friend from Ireland, I think a few months ago, Michelle. And uh, Michelle is a visual artist who paints, draws, does video installations and uh, journeying around everyday practices, around people, place, and of course, water. And Michelle brings to her work, her mixed heritage, both from India and Ireland that we'll talk a bit about later. And a lot of her work, apart from her work on water, focuses on themes related to migration, displacement, and the concept of home. So with that, Michelle, I'm very, Pleased to welcome you to, uh, you know, share your presentation about 20, 25 min minutes or so, and then we'll open it up for discussion. I'm sorry that I think a lot of people are still joining, but uh, that's great. We'll see you. We'll hear from you, Michelle. Thank you very much for that. That's uh, lovely, Sarah. And thank you, Sukrit. And thank you, Mansi, for, for asking me uh, to join. Um, I think what Sukrit said is wonderful in that the uh, it's wonderful to open up the conversation to people possibly outside of the scientific field, 
for their um for their input around water too and so i'm delighted i'm delighted to be asked and hopefully i learn and you might learn something of my practice in the process of this conversation um, so thank you for that. Um, so if we want, we can start sharing the screen and I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I have about 21 screens, about sorry, about 21 slides here. There's about three videos in them. So hopefully, hopefully your internet, uh, wherever you are, is OK and you'll be able to see them. They're quite short. So just to let you know about myself, my name is Michelle Boyle. And here is where we meet is what I use as the introduction to my work because I believe that art and making art, whether it's music like Sukrit or a visual art like me, is a space for people to come together to meet. Um, it's an open space where people can meet with the work of the artist and the artist can meet with their audience. Um, so that is, um, that's the idea of what I feel art is and what bring, it brings to the world. Um, so the second slide um, is, Mansi, are you, I'm not sure who's doing, Sukrit is doing the slides. We can move on to the second slide, to slide two. We are on slide two. No, we're not. We're no, on we are not one. moving. Uh, we are not moving and also a slide show, we are not seeing. We are yeah, so Sukrit, you need picture. to click on the right, the cup at the bottom so we can see it as a slide show. Oh, wait one second. Oops. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. So this is um this is a self-portrait in the studio. And the reason I wanted to just to introduce myself and introduce my work and why I'm a painter. Um I actually I actually did my degree in cultural anthropology and my master's in landscape archaeology and architecture. So I was working in that and writing. Um, I was writing published work for the government on uh, our belt heritage and our landscape. Um, but I felt that it wasn't enough. I felt that um, there was another way, uh, that there was another language to reach people. And I had always painted and I had always wanted to do that. So um, at probably the worst of times and the best of times, I became a painter. I had my small, my fourth child. I have four children in total. So I became a painter and an artist with four small children, four small children, and um sort of left a very secure job to, to do something that was quite precarious, to say the least. <laughs> a precarious, a precarious livelihood. Um so why I became a painter was because I felt that I had to sort things out about my own inheritance. And that was specifically my Irish Indian inheritance. My birth mother is Irish and my birth father is Indian. Um, I was adopted to Dublin, born in London, adopted to Dublin. Um, and so I didn't really have an insight to my own inheritance and who I was. So it was very important for me to process that in paint. Some people do it in words, some people do it in music. Um, my medium was paint. So this is a almost a full, full scale life size painting of me in the studio with my brush in my hand sitting on the stool looking at myself um, and I and I paint ongoing regular self portraits and some of them will come through in 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 the screenshots that I've that you'll see so we can move on to the next um to the next one so this is called Cedarwood Road for anybody who is um a U2 the band U2 for anybody who's a fan of U2 I actually grew up on the same road as Bono the lead singer so um, this is my garden and this is my adoptive mother, uh, Mary Boyle, and this she's holding me. So these were the stories. So when I started painting, I wanted to actually deal with the invisible. So that, this was the invisible inheritance. And I think that that's probably, I think that if I had to think of the connecting theme in my work, it's trying to make visible the invisible. It's trying to uh, create a visual language for things that that are difficult to find in words. So what I was doing here was recreating uh, a family album, basically, in the absence of one. So I repainted my past as a child. And this is my mother holding me and my three sisters. We're all different mixed race children. And um, 
she was a wonderful woman and she encouraged my art. She encouraged my art career from the age of nine, giving me the bus fare to go to the city centre to stand in front of art and to do drawing classes in the public galleries of Dublin. Um, and I'm very grateful to her for that. Um, so we can move on to the next slide. These first few slides, as I said, are really just just introducing you to my painting. This is a very large painting. This is actually in Mumbai in an exhibition at the moment. And what I'm painting here, what I'm showing here is generations of my own both adoptive and birth inheritance. The people featured in this are from various different places. I'm there down to the bottom left holding my own daughter. Um, and as I said, very large painting. Um, and it's... Uh, yeah, it's, 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 these are very personal paintings. And when I see them, I haven't look, actually looked at this in a while because it's been away. It's been in India for about a year. Um, but uh, I actually, you know, there's, there's a huge amount of emotion goes into these for me. I'm the type of painter and artist who paints very much from my own perspective, from the world around me. From It's all very close. It's all very to do with my own daily experience, the people I know, um, the, my feelings, um, so that is, uh, and I, I suppose I would be termed a narrative painter in that sense. But um, so that's what that painting is. And if anybody wants to see it, it is in Mumbai. It is an exhibition in Nine Fish Gallery in Mumbai. Um, there, yeah. So we can move on. We can move on to the next painting. Um, yeah. So what? So that's just giving you a background. What? What? The next few slides are showing you really is a little bit about my process. So in about 2016, 2017, I got a bursary, uh, a residency to go to Kerala, and I had been to India before, and I had been um, when I was in college, and I had spent time around the Narmada with Baba Ante and worked in uh, worked in Vikas Ante's um, leprosy uh, colony in Maharashtra. But this was um, this time I went to uh, to and this time I went knowing my inheritance, knowing that I had a connection with India due to the very basic thing of actually traveling. I didn't take my oil paints. I am an oil painter and the painters paintings you've seen before are, are oils, but oil paint doesn't really work very well to travel with it. So I actually took my sketchbook and I took watercolors, which I had never used before. So I went and um, the, the painting to the right is actually the river, the Wagahora River at the Ajanta Caves. And that was sort of my I, my interpretation of the river and the boat coming down the river and the temples, both combining floor plans and my my image of it from being there. The one on the left, these two really, really actually for me are really they're important little paintings and there's a whole sketchbook of sketchbooks of these and these are about washing and it's about washing clothes because for me I suppose the unknown I'm doing two things I suppose in these paintings I'm just sitting observing and when I say sitting observing for these sketches I was sitting um for days um in this little village in Kerala and I was watching a woman putting her washing in and out on the line. And for the first day, I got quite a lot of attention and people came up and um, asked what I was doing and were watching what I was doing. And I was a sort of a bit of an oddity in the village. Um, and I can completely understand that. I mean, you know, people are working and people are going about their daily business and you're sort of sitting in one position. Um, but what it does is people then start not to notice you. And it's a it's it's actually a great way of observing what's it's observing just life going by. And um, the other thing about the watercolor was because of the heat, it was dry. The watercolor would dry very fast. So it was very easy to do watercolors very quickly. And I realized that actually I really liked the medium. I really liked the medium of watercolor. Very different to oil paint. Oil paint has. Um, and if we want to go on actually to the next, if we want to go on to the next slide, Sukrit, just to show the difference. That's the lightness of watercolour. But on the next slide, you'll see <clears throat> this is oil paint. So this is heavy. So oil paint is, is heavy. You work it in the studio and it has um, it has a to me, to me, it has quite a strong energy. It's got a strong presence when you go into the studio. It smells. 
it's there the minute you go in the door it sticks to your clothes it it you just you you move with it all the time whereas water is ethereal water color to work with is so light it just it's just a much easier mobile medium but also it's a medium that you can't hide in so you cannot hide in water and that's for me is a really important thing in other words when you put a mark down in watercolor it sort of stays in oil paint you have the you have the flexibility and you have the um you have that ability to change marks to layer up to to scrape back in watercolor you can't really do that and that's what i love about watercolor and water is that there is an honesty and a flow to the mark that I find really interesting. And that sort of sent me on a journey about water. It, it, so although the pigment and all of that is important, what became very obvious to me was the importance of the water itself in my process um, as a painter. So um, if we want, we can go on to the next image. Um, yeah. Uh, so again, this is an oil painting. But uh, just a little bit, I, so I explained that I, you know, my background and where I came from in terms of my own mixed race inheritance, my search for identity, the feeling of being displaced. I mean, but, uh, I wasn't a refugee. I didn't, it, it's not, that wasn't the background I came from, but I came from a background where two people were from different countries and ended in London. And both in my birth and adoptive family, there was travel. There was travel and there was movement. Um, for economic reasons and for various different reasons, people moved around for a better life, um, for love, for different reasons. Um, and so so that thing of moving and of, of of moving and of, I suppose, of me reconnecting with an inheritance that I didn't really know and going to India and finding finding connection on a, on a sort of a deep level there Um was 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 really important and i suppose because of that my 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 own practice my own practice i certain issues resonate with me and of course the migrant crisis is one of those and particularly women particularly women who have to move particularly women who have to lift their children under their arm lift their children on their back and travel and go and move it's not that men don't face these things but my my I suppose what resonates for me is the women's experience and that became quite oh, sorry just to say that also my husband works in in sort of that field so these are conversations that we have in around the kitchen table these are conversations I have with my two daughters and two sons you know about the world we live in um because I think we're all inhabiting we all face the daily things of having to put food on the table of having to look out for each other to create safe environments. And so I find that I find that things going on in the world where people are forced into moving, very upsetting. And I just I just find that they resonate with me in some way. So this particular painting is about that. And again, it's about the women's experience. It's about the migrant and it's a painting of women on a boat in the Mediterranean. And the painting is from a newspaper article and um, you can see they're all crowded, crowded together and crossing the Mediterranean, which is which is, uh, you know, is just a huge issue for people being lost and drowned and the whole uh, people, people um, smuggling and all everything that goes on is, 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 is quite bad. So that that actual painting um, was in a show and um, it's called 2019 because it was 100 years after a poem called 1919. And it's about the world we that I felt we were living in. This this is the issues of our day, um, and that was shown subsequently in in New York in the uh, I think in the embassy in New York. It it was on show for that. So I suppose um, am I okay to go on, or did anybody want to ask me any questions, or will we leave those to the end, Sukrit or Mansi, or what do you think? Fine. I, um, continue, Michelle. I continue. It's it's I'm I am going okay. I hope I hope people aren't. Uh, Hope people are keeping with me and that I'm 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 explaining my work okay, because what we're going to do is we're going to go on to some other work which shows really my own process starts pulling out a little bit that I'm getting a bit more confident in my work and in my in the language of my work. So if for the next piece, but I hope you can see the the connections between you th you'll see the thread in the work itself. So the next piece, uh, the next slide, um. 
please, uh, Sukrit, is a small video. So <clears throat> this again is, I suppose, the thing of absence and presence. Again, a women's narrative. And this piece is called The Ordinary Woman. And it's actually, the, it's actually uh, it contains my wedding dress, my adoptive mother and uh, my birth mother's clothes that I reconstructed from paper. And what this was about was in response to um, a couple of things. We always had washing at home and it sort of goes back to that me watching the woman putting out the washing. There's something about there's something about women's work. There's something about a washing line. There's something about revealing, uh, revealing intimate, the intimacy of your life in a washing line that I find very interesting. And again, it's the thing of the it's it's the water. It's the process of hand washing, machine washing, putting things out. And I had taken for granted the washing line um, as a narrative piece that when I was small, you know, my mother hanging all our clothes out on the line. But I realized, too, that it. Um, it says it says so it's, it sort of says about the sort of world we inhabit ourselves, about our lives. And. There was I find them aesthetically very beautiful. I find washing lines very beautiful. And when you go to countries where they don't have washing lines, I really miss them. So wherever I go with my sketchbooks and I've sketched washing lines in lots of countries, um, I, I, uh, I'm drawn to them. I'm drawn to them and I see them as women's work. And I'm, you know, I'm drawn to them when I'm in India too. I have many photographs and paintings, sketches of them. Um, so, as I said, this is sort of pulling a little bit away from, from painting, but the aesthetic is the same. The thread is the same. It's, it's women, I suppose. It's the story. And again, water again is in this. It's in the background, but it's in this. Um, it's in this. This piece was part of an exhibition in the UN headquarters in New York, where it was about women's work. And there was poetry recited alongside this um, about all the different types of work women do and all the roles we inhabit as daughters, as sisters, as mothers, as carers, um, as workers. Um, and it was a very beautiful poem by an Irish poet, uh, Mary Darcy, called The Ordinary Woman, and hence the name of this piece is called The Ordinary Woman. Um, and it was it was shown in, in New York in the headquarters at a conference on, on women and on women's rights, particularly rural women. Um, so that is um, that's that. So this again is just showing you about my practice pulling out a little bit. And this sort of moves on to the next slide, which then almost like this piece has fallen flat. And it's um, it's a little little video again. And this has some sound, some music in it. <laughs> So I suppose what this is about is um, this really sort of started incidentally moving on from my work. COVID happened and COVID impacted on us all in various sorts of ways. And as an artist, what it meant for me was closing down, uh, closing down and closing into my studio. And we had a five kilometer um, limit on where we could travel. Now, I'm very lucky. I live in rural Ireland, so I can go out and walk across the landscape. Um, but I found that I was getting extremely claustrophobic in my studio and um, I live in Cavan, which is a uh, which is a really lake rich county. There's 365 lakes in this county and it has. So I live, you know, five, a 10 minute walk from a lake and this is the lake you're seeing here. And what I started doing under COVID was I actually started sitting with my sketchbook like I had done in India, sitting with my sketchbook, bringing that back out again and painting out in the landscape. Um, and painting out in the landscape day in, day out. And then I got a canoe and I started going out onto the lake and bringing my sketchbook out onto the lake, using the lake water to make paintings. Um, and again, because of my presence, like sitting, sitting in the village in India, because of my presence, people actually who were using the lake within that radius 
started seeing me and chatting to me. So I started getting into these conversations with swimmers, with fishermen, with walkers, uh, with uh, people who were looking after the lake, government officials, people like that. And this was happening very slowly and gradually over two years. And so something else started st- happening to me. And what it was, was I, I, I started really looking at the water. Um, and I wanted to, I wanted others to look at it as well as a, as a thing of beauty. I wanted, I wanted them to look at it for the aesthetic of it. And I also, I also really wanted to understand more about the water itself. I realized, um, and maybe if we want to move on to the next slide for this, I realized that having walked this landscape and being, you know, and working in landscape archaeology and, and, and architecture, walking the landscape, that I, I thought I knew the landscape. And then I realized that actually I didn't know these lakes. I didn't know water. I didn't know this fundamental part of the landscape. All I knew about it was that I drive around it to drop the children to school or I I walk around it or but I didn't really know it that well. And <clears throat> so I started swimming in, in the lake, you know, slowly. And and now I would go in most times, uh, you know, three, four times a week, all year round. Um, and it's opened up a huge new world. It's open, it's opened up a world I just didn't know existed. I realized that under COVID, under the five kilometer, um, under the five kilometer travel restriction, that in the water I could be on the moon. I, I could be so far away. I could be, it, it was a landscape I didn't know. So the little Epilimnion video there to the right is uh is that. So if that can play, um, if that can play Sukrit, um we can there is actually a yeah, there's audio to this as well. Um, what epilimnium is, is it's the surface layer of a lake. And it's the surface layer of a lake that allows photosynthesis to happen. So it's where the water is most clear. Um, so it's, l- lakes are stratified. So they have different layers of water to them. Um, again, I'm not a scientist, but um, I've been told and I've read up on the on the layers of the lake, the epilimnium. So these the thermocline, there's different layers. And lakes are incredible because they actually are like a clock. So the lake is like a clock. So what happens with the lake is the lake. So if you have the epilimni up here and you have the thermocline, you have the other layers underneath, what happens with the lake is, so this is the lake. The lake actually does this twice a year, like a clock. It turns and the layers change. So the cold, the, oh, my battery's going low on my, on my laptop. The layers change. So they have to, um, they have to, uh, the, the cold layer comes to the top and the warm layer sinks to the bottom. And you can actually, the only way you can really know this is by being in the water. And it's a, it's a, it's a very palpable change. It's a completely, you, you know it, you feel it. You feel one day you go in and say the water has changed. Um, so it, it's, uh, I realized that being up close and in the water, you get to see water up close. I also, as I said, meeting with people around the lake, um, I also started realizing the huge knowledge that, that people had, the local people who come in and go, the scientists who were coming and going, the swimmers who were coming and going. Um, and so that sort of started encouraging me to 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 be the uh, participant observer that I think I I think that actually I am as an artist, that I'm part of something, but I'm also observing something. It's sort of like, I suppose, an ethnographer, if you were if you were looking at using a word from cultural anthropology, it's like an ethnographer going in um, and just watching. Uh, watching and then asking things. So I have to admit, I <laughs> I know a lot less. I know I I I'm really just a bit very curious about other people's knowledge and what other people know. And I found that I was this was a great opportunity to sit there and learn from other people. Um, so I have much more questions than I have answers. Um, 
so yeah so if we go to the next slide then um yeah the next slide is yeah so this is just patricia watts i i just did a body of work of paintings recently around um the lake over the past three years i just had an exhibition of uh paintings of the lake of watercolors using water from the lake and this was part of the introduction to the catalogue to the exhibition catalogue by patricia watts um eco arts place and some of you may know them I recent, recently joined them. But I think she she gives she she can put the language to what I'm trying to do um, more than I can. Um, so this is just one of my paintings of the river that feeds into that lake that we were looking at. It feeds into and um, so this this is a studio painting. It's take so I would have done a small sketch in watercolor at the at the river and then went back to the studio and painted this. So I mean, part of an artist is I'm an artist. I have to make a living. I make my living from my art. So I sell these paintings. I don't really sell the paintings of myself and my family. There, there's some of them I do and some of them I don't because they're when they're going out there, they're going out there, but um. These I do, and these have these have gone to various different places, and that allows me to um, to follow the path that I want to follow in my work, which um, which is in quite quite inclusive, and as I said, it, which you'll see is sort of crossing different different sections, and is probably the reason that I'm here talking talking to you today, is because of it it goes beyond just the physical act of painting. So on the next slide, it, uh, you'll see some of the um, some of the other activity. So this is a uh, water blitz and this is where people around Ireland take samples of water for testing. And um, then these are all put together by uh, DCU is Dublin City University. And there's a water institute there and they run this. Um, they do this call out to people to do this. So this river I'm at, this small river is actually one of the little feeder rivers that goes into the lake. And what I what we're particularly looking for here, it's a very simple, it's a very simple process. You get the things posted to you in the post and you take the water sample and you test for phosphates and nitrates, which would be the um, which would be the most important concerns in the rivers and the water around where I live in a in an agricultural, in an agricultural area uh, for runoff. So that's what I'm doing there um, at the river. Um, and also I'm wearing, I'm wearing the scarf. This is just an aside. The scarf I'm wearing is um, my son was playing football the day before and they won. So that's his colours. <laughs> that's his football, his football uh, club colours. So um, if you, yeah, you can read that. It just say, says what it is. So then this again is looking at this. Is, this is again is talking to other people around the water about their um the one on the left is actually an aerial view it's a drone view of the water and um this was actually given to me by a swimmer who wanted to look at distances and was using technology a uh, uh, drone technology to actually look at the lake and look at it from above and i found this really interesting because i find the macro and the micro views are um are, are can be similar so the 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 view on the right is actually uh water from the same from from where you're looking at and um there's swan feather this we would have swan the swans and various different birds nesting along here um and of course the whatever fish and swans and whatever the life around the lake it's it's indicative of the water quality as well um and uh you can see how this has been developed here. So the lake has a, you know, it's there's a school. So the school is there. So the school is, it's, it's interesting because the school is where my children would have gone to school. And um, the lake as a resource, which is a word I am not don't really like to use, but it's not actually really used that much by the school itself in terms of in terms of a learning facility, in terms of introducing students to water and to the challenges it faces, especially, you know, where you have um increasing population density you've got all the issues that come with that you've got forestry you've got industry this isn't just related to this body of water this is this is everybody of everybody of water you know around ireland were there and in other countries um 
so everybody every place is facing challenges from various different from basically from human settlement more or less which uh you know which for you know as a background in archaeology of course that's why people are beside water because we needed to survive um so it's it's this thing of what we're doing to it has become increasingly an important part of my practice and using the water from the lake um in the practice again it it, it makes people it makes people think about the water as i was saying i hadn't thought about it when i came to sort of live here so if we go on to the next slide then um one of the people that uh one of the people that um uh, yeah, we'll just go on to the next slide, so Chris, please. Yeah, so this is um this is uh, a quote on the left is from Dr. Ronan, Ronan Foley, who's the Department of Geography and NUI Maynooth, uh, National University of Ireland. And Ronan is very interesting because he writes about um, blue spaces in the landscape, which is health and blue spaces. So how we need water, uh, how how it's important for our health in lots of different aspects. And he has written on the various places from contemporary hospitals and the contemporary health practice to the past where we had things like holy wells and sweat houses and, and also in other countries, uh, Turkish baths, places of places of communal gathering, places of water veneration. So I'm actually of this university. So um, I, I would... Um, you know, so I've I've met and I invited Ronan to come down because he he was less familiar, I suppose, with with uh, lakes than than possibly sea swimming and people who were spending time around the coast. So he came down and we did took some drone footage and we did some um, not drone footage, sorry, we did some uh, GoPro, some GoPro put, footage. Uh, and we did interviews in the water. So he spoke to to us in the water about about the water and about how it made us feel and about the the how we felt it um impacted on our lives and just why we did it i suppose and it was it was an interesting it was an interesting thing and for me because of that invitation i wanted then to put more of a structure on these conversations that i was having so i applied to my local um my local arts office and I asked, would they would they support me doing some more conversations? So in the next image, um, in the next image, uh, I in the next slide, there's some pictures, I think, of some of these things. Yeah. So so on the left, this is a conversation where a few people came out and we actually talked about what water meant in a sort of in a religious sense to us. So we've people representing different um, different uh, religious beliefs here. And uh, I'm going to do this again because there is a few more people I want to bring out. It was just so nice and it was so good and the exchange and the knowledge, the sharing of knowledge, just what what water meant in terms of in terms of births, in terms of uh, rites of passage in your life, uh, at moments of birth, at death, at um, healing, uh, blessing. So we had a lovely conversation about that, and that these are recorded. So I have I have this information. The grant I had is very small; it really only covered the actual boat, the boat, the hire of the boat to go out. So I've gone out a few times and had a few boat trips. So I have this information, and I have this to work with. So these are conversations, by the way. I'm I'm saying them like they're very Irish. These are con conversations that can happen anywhere. So to me, this wouldn't, you know, this conversation is as relevant in India as is relevant in France as it is relevant in in America or, or wherever. There are, there are conversations about being human and are in are interacting with this element of water that's so vital to us. Underneath is just a map. So part of this again is looking at maps, looking at um, settlement patterns looking at um, how how the use of water has changed, the impact of the water. So that's a, quite an old map uh, below. And again, for me, uh, I love maps. I love, <laughs> love looking at them. I love the way they're drawn. And um, I, you know, again, I would like to be able to, to, to take this into my practice somewhere and represent it in different ways. Um, on there, are we sorry? Are we okay for time? There, am I going over, or am I? Are we okay for time? 
Hi, Michelle. I didn't want to interrupt you because it was so interesting. Um, <laughs> are, there, we, are there how many more slides of it? I'll we, tell you, we'll fly through the rest of them. Is it, have we two more minutes? Have we? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You could take another two to five minutes. Yeah. OK, so this is just then the Blackwater. Uh, this is I went to a conference on climate community collaboration as an artist to see what we could do. And actually, there was lots of people there and there was people from all sorts of different backgrounds. And I actually felt the only person who talked any sense about the water was the fisherman. He was the only person who actually understood the water. He spoke so much sense. He talked about the sewage pipes going into the water, the temporary sewage pipes. He talked about the flies. Um, how they changed, how they were decreasing the biodiversity. He just had the knowledge that and I felt he wasn't listened to. And I got so sad coming back um, that I wrote this poem. And then I the, that video can play, actually. Um, it is it is just the video. The um, I don't know if Sukri can get that playing there just to pick the image to the right. So, Sukri, can you click the <laughs> That's the point. So then I felt I felt my responsibility. I, I actually I felt angry. I felt angry that we were this this water was going, you know, that the water had the strains on it and that we weren't looking after it. Um so we'll go on to the next slide. And really then that just that developed onto a project I did with the Irish Museum of Modern Art where I asked people from around Ireland to send me water. So here I have different waters here. I brought some, let's see where they are. So I brought some samples there and they all had scan codes on the back so people could actually scan into the stories that people had written and people could look at the different colours of the water reflecting the landscapes of where they came from. So these were all part of, of the, um, part of this Earth Rising Festival at the Irish Museum of Modern Art, which was actually using, as Sukri said at the outset, about giving um, a creative voice to the problems that water is facing in the world. And um, I had drawn, so I have a sort of an ongoing submission thing where people can send me stories and um, water samples and all the water was there. And as I said, there was a scan code on the back. So people could sit and listen to the sound of the fountain in the back and read the stories about the water. Um, in the next image, you'll see uh, you'll see those. And the little boy on the left is actually painting using. So I asked people then to, to go around and look. So there was about maybe 40 water samples to go around and feel what water res maybe maybe that they felt resonated with them or story and then use that water in either a painting or in a drawing or, or to write because I had um, I had fountain pens or pens with water, water based pens that they could use. And so it was lovely. It was over four days and some of the poems and things that people wrote, uh, I had uh, printed on to eco friendly materials and placed them in the fountain. Um, the next one is the water divining. Um, again, my interest, you know, doesn't I don't really put any boundaries boundaries on, on my exploration of water. So uh, this is Jerry Kremen of the Water Diviners of Ireland. There in, you, there's water divining everywhere. There's water divining in India. That's in America. It's everywhere. These are my water divining rods. Uh, if anybody wants to see them later, I can show them. That's another one there. Um, I'm a practitioner, but I've only started. But I'm quite amazed at, at how they work. And I'm quite, quite amazed about the tradition that goes back a long way uh, into prehistory. It's still practiced very much in Ireland um, as a in the countryside. <clears throat> as a method of finding water underground. And we've only two slides left, and then that's it. Here on these, the left is uh, a holy well near where I live, not too far. This is from one of the contributors uh, to that project with Emma. And on the right, that's me and Amdabad at a, at a well in Gujarat. And again, that is a playable video. It's very short. And I'm just fascinated. It's called Monuments to Water. I'm I'm fascinated by these wells. And I really would like to do a project on these because I just think they're architecturally stunning. But I'm I'm fascinated by the fascinated just and like Ireland, some many have fallen into disuse, but they're um beautiful. So 
that's that. That's just the two. The last slide is the two recent publications. And if I could, I can. I have one paragraph that I would just like to read, if that's okay, Sarah, or would you like me to leave? No, it that's fine. Long? That's fine. Go ahead. Yeah, yes. it's just from this one. So this is the little catalogue that I did for the um, IMA presentation with other people. And one piece, because I think this speaks for water in the world. It doesn't speak for just for water in Ireland. It speaks for water everywhere. This man had worked, has worked for 40 years in um, river quality and water quality. And um, he very kindly, uh, he very kindly did a, did a, wrote a piece. And this is the little piece. I'm just going to read his and then I'll be finished. <laughs> And thank you all for listening. So I thank you all for listening. Um, when I look away from the river, I cannot help but see the daily struggle that this river must overcome to remain the custodian for the salmonids and indeed the multitude of species which depend on this river for life. Sometimes it gives me the feeling of being tired, tired from this constant battle. The heavily afforested sections of riverbank and hinterland change the landscape and as a result, diminished the quality of water entering the system by the network of drains, springs and small streams. The wastewater treatment plants which adorn the system are prone to breakdowns under pressure from the expanded villages, another burden that this river must deal with. Large scale industries developing the infrastructure to cater for these, along with intense farming practices, all impact on this fragile ecosystem. Over the years, I have realized that human interaction is usually detrimental to our waterways. The time has come for us all to play our part in changing these interactions to positive ones. The riverbanks are straining under the pressures, but they have not yet been breached. If you listen closely, you might just hear these rivers asking for help. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. That was a deeply moving and very, very inspirational presentation. I didn't want to stop you because you were taking us through so many things. And I know there are people in the audience who may want to ask you questions. So I'm just going to keep my, um, my own points short. Michelle, you made a point somewhere. I mean, just there's so many things I want to comment on. I don't know where to <laughs> really start. But I was just, well, on the side, you know, the 2019 picture that you showed us about refugees and move movement, and also a lot of refugees moved across water. Because there was a very big, there was a very moving piece that was done at the Kochi Benale by an Arab artist, I'm forgetting his name, but I have a photograph somewhere, where it was a room full of water and people had to walk in that room. You must have seen that image. I yeah. actually, actually, Sarah, I actually went to that and I walked through it. Yes. He was actually a South American poet who did South that. American, it was yeah. a, the most, you're right, the most amazing piece of work. Yeah. And then there was the, and um, yeah, then there was Khalid Hussein's uh, poem, The Sea of Fame where the far, it's an anima animated poem. I'm not sure if you've seen it. It's really no. very beautifully done. And uh, uh, the father is talking to his son and telling him what has happened and how the family has to move from the conflict and, you know, across the water and all. It's very beautiful. If someone can share a link, please oh, do. Oh, yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Uh, but then I was thinking, OK, she did. She, you know, talked about movement in 2019 and then in 2020, the world came to a stop. You know, there was no movement except for the movement and the, the voices of water. So in a way, you know, that was a very sort of uh, poignant ju juxtaposition for me. But also you made a comment making visible the invisible. Right. And that's something that has been used last year in UNESCO's year for groundwater where in fact in our one of our exhibitions, Roberto uh, is here from the Global Network of Water Museums and we, we did this amazing exhibition where we've also used a lot of images of the step wells, but also oh. other groundwater things around the world. And you know, when I wanted to start a museum, I wanted to do it in a step well, Michelle. Oh, my first wow. idea okay. the museum, yeah, yeah. I said, how do you lock up a step well? You know, when you think of a museum, you think of artifacts. And you think of things, right, that you're going to put, but you can't lock a step well. It's open. <laughs> so yes. I close it, you know. <laughs> so I was, anyway, it would have been very impractical. But 
Michelle, you talked about many things in the context of making visible the invisible. W women's work, the whole washing uh, thing, because again, we've also in our, when we've had our water museum meetings, I've seen pictures of women washing clothes in Portugal, black and white images from the late yeah. 1800s, early 1900s. I've seen similar images from Ecuador. And there's always made me think about this whole universal language of women washing clothes and oh, yeah. displacement that has happened from riverbanks because riverbanks and river riverfronts are being built, but also in a way women losing this collective, uh, you know, this sort of uh, collective of coming together to wash clothes. Uh, so because of pipes and water and hand pumps and all the convenience that all of us want with, you know, 24 by seven water, right? Yes. But you also talked about faith and what we're seeing around the world. And again, I come back to the network of water museums and I'm going to invite Eriberto to say a few words as well. But you talked about faith and water and faith and how because just yesterday we were looking at different logos that we want to use with our logo on how, you know, peace building, because we're seeing a conflict around us in the Middle East and that a lot of that conflict is based around water, whether we like it or not. I mean, we think of it as land, but land is associated with water, right? Or water is associated with land. <laughs> and so that again is an invisible element that we don't often think about when we think of the glass of water that we're drinking. And uh, yes, the work that you're doing as a um, diviner, I think we exchanged some notes on that. And I was yeah. saying how this priest that lived in India for so many years from my grandmother's birthplace, which is uh, Lit Lithuania, and how he was a water di diviner and how many of the wells that he helped people in this drought prone part of uh, the state um, where I am. It's just that, um, you know, he didn't want to be acknowledged as that. Yes. Because it conflicted with his faith, right? But so many people came to speak to us to tell us that their wells, even after 30 years and 40 years, still had water. You know, that was amazing. So I've just kind of brought everything together. <laughs> you have. You could have given that, Sarah. You could have. You could have given my presentation. That's wonderful. Thank you. So really, I want to sum it up by saying what you've done for us is painted the eth ethnography of water. Oh, right? bringing okay. these elements of gender and faith and peace and migration and displacement and movement and you know the visible and the invisible and so on. Uh, you've really given us uh, ethnography of water. And I know some of the people in this uh, um, webinar are young artists themselves. I think we're, uh, they'd be also interested to ask you something. I know Eriberto may want to ask you something. So I'm going to let the floor speak. Sukrit, you will have to unmute yourself and moderate. But thank you so much, Michelle. Very I just welcome. wanted Great. to... Um, uh, kind of sum up this thing and let others ask if you have a few other questions. There Great, are no thank you so questions in the chat box, but does anyone want to kickstart? Um, we don't have a lot of time. Is there any questions that... There aren't any in the chat box. Does anyone want to ask? There's a hand raised. Uh, I think, yeah. Ms. Mansi has a question, I think, to begin with. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Michelle, for the wonderful presentation. It was so, so deep. And somehow I could also connect uh, the fact that you have a background in architecture and ecology. You could bring that out, you know, through your various forms of presentation because so much of relationship of the built environment and landscape was very clear uh, when you were uh, bringing those, uh, you know, stories or narratives as you uh, called in your presentation. Uh, so my question to you is more related to uh, the water diviners and it's, uh, you know, a relationship with, again, when we talk about what Sarah was also talking about, peace building process, because time and again, water has uh, been the source of connecting societies or connecting people for that matter. When we look at it today in India's context, because we have also traveled there, you have seen how 
how strongly we are connected to water with all rituals, festivals, ceremonies, religion, and all. Uh, and you were relating your own lake nearby and you how beautifully you mentioned that earlier it was just something which was near your house. It was only until yeah. you, you went into it, you were relating it also with the lake and uh, the school, which is not linking it directly and how it is important. I would like to know a little bit about how in Irish culture, there, what is what are the kinds of relationship people uh, you have with water in terms of rituals and festivals? Yesterday, I was giving an international talk on role of water in rituals and festivals, and I was focusing on Hindu uh, rituals and festivals. I'm just curious out of it because you are living around lakes and water. The water is everywhere. That's a very interesting question. That's a very interesting question, um, and I think. We have, a, we have a wonderful mythology when it comes to water. So there's a wonderful mythology of gods and goddesses and spirits in the rivers and contained, contained areas of water in the landscape of fresh water. So there's a very deep, rich history of that. Unfortunately, a lot of those places of holy wells, which would have been, which would have been ritual places of worship, they would have been pre-Christian places of worship that were then Christianized. That's very simplistic, but, but more or less. Um, but it, it, it was the... It was the um... it, um, it, it, so to answer your question, I'd say more now. Again, COVID, with COVID, people started going back out into the landscape a lot more. And like myself, re-engaging with the water. Probably more for therapy, I would say in terms of going in for swimming, for rowing, for sitting by it, rediscovering their local areas and rediscovering their waterways. Um, biodiversity has become a huge issue. So people are actually looking and appreciating anew. In terms of the veneration and in terms of that, it's there There are still particular days around the year when people, generally it's confined to a, confined to a locality. There aren't big national event days where people go to the river not certainly not like india it's not it doesn't have the same it doesn't have the same um significance let's say we do have it with, with mountains actually strangely you know where people will go on specific days and they're often very very big days and very big pattern they're called like pattern days where people will go and worship and walk and pray um saying that Saying that, when I was in the lake, swimming in a lake one day, I did see two people, three people, and they were baptizing another person in the water. It was quite unusual. And I think it was just a very secluded lake. And I happened to be there that day. But that would be an exception. And um, so part of part of what I'm doing is is maybe bringing a little bit more visibility to that or asking the questions about that. But it's a really good point, Mansi, and I'd love to. I'd love to see that um, develop a little bit more. So there is a room for comparative study and maybe that will be an opportunity to do some revival of uh, all the mythological narratives yeah. which are sitting in Ireland because we have a mythology, we are associated, but somehow we are also abusing water to a large extent. That's also yeah. a concern where Sarah and I were actually, we came to know each other about. And okay. you um, mentioned about step wells and uh, and water museum. Sarah was bringing it, and because when you look at these co you know community uh, water structures, and you you rightly said you don't like the word resource, and uh, you want to be, probably we have to look at more as a ritualistic uh, you know uh, yes medium for us to relate with. Uh, do you see uh, that in future the way water crisis is rising? Uh, this kind of medium, water arts, I mean, water films, you know, and of course, we have kept the science aside on Friday conversations, I will keep the, uh, it limited to water arts and films and all. Uh, can they become a very strong medium to bring a change in the society? Because history tells that art movements have been ex uh, extremely, uh, you know, instrumental in bringing a change in the way people look at things or I mean it can be any other things you know war is another aspect of it do you see the role of art can really uh, make a big change in the way water crisis is rising or in the way we can you know sensitize ourselves towards water 
I mean, Ireland is not so much probably having problem of water pollution and it has other kind of water problems I read for coming to the show, but um, other South Asian countries are seriously suffering with water crisis. Yeah, I think I think that the arts have a role to play, and um, I think that I think that both need to learn from each other. I think arts needs to be more integrated into science, and I think science needs to be more creative. They, you need more creative thinkers in science. Um, I think that there's uh, arts can uh, and because a lot of this unfortunately has to do with funding. Um, I think the arts can be a very powerful voice. I do feel that that the arts, you know, maybe have have been a little bit quietened, um, and I do feel that that there's that, that be, and that maybe is because we live in a capitalist sort of a society. But I think ground up roots, you know, approach using arts in communities, visually presenting things, and um, you can do you can make big statements in very small ways. Um, it doesn't always need a huge amount of funding. It doesn't always need, um, but it just needs, it needs authenticity and it needs truth. And I think it needs to be done for the right reasons. Um, and yeah, but it, it absolutely, yeah. And that goes across whether it's music, visual um, or visual. And again, the other voice I would say is the people who use the water, the fishermen, the people who are actually at the water's edge or in the water. I think their voices are so valid. That's what I was going to ask you as Thank well, you. Michelle, because a lot of your conversation and your work was about making those voices of the poor and marginalized and um, heard in a way through poetry, through through words, et cetera. And I think that's a very powerful role that art can play. Uh, you know, the art of, of um, yeah, uh, the theater of struggle. Yeah. You know, songs of uh, movements and, and so forth that have come out of all of that. Sukrit, I know, sings a beautiful song of one of our uh, so, social move, move movements around water. He's not going to sing it now. <laughs> but, you know, so uh, so there is the theatre of the oppressed, that that word to to use a cliched uh, thing. And that's great. Eriberto, you have your hand up, finally. Please un unmute yourself, Arabeto. Okay, go ahead, Arabeto. Can we see you? Uh, I don't know. Can you see me? Yes, yes, yes. I can hear see me? You. Yeah. Hello. Hello. So, congratulations, first of all, uh, Michelle. I like this definition that you made uh, uh, about uh, making um, uh, big statements uh, in uh, small ways through the art, and this is. Uh, uh, kind of message that we also tried to promote uh, as a global network of water museums. Eh? Many museums uh, related to water uh, all around the world, and one in Ireland, by the way, yes, yeah. <laughs> are trying indeed uh, to um, create a new relationship with people, um, mostly uh, um, trying to elaborate the heritage from the past. But um, I think, as a previous speaker was also uh, emphasizing, that uh, um, today to make people more aware, we need also new languages eh, to, to make people more aware about the global water crisis. We need uh, new languages. And the art is definitely one of uh, the most powerful, I think, uh, instrument, eh? <laughs> one of the most powerful mm -hmm. tools. We also organized as a global network some, some webinars on that, um, exactly uh, uh, because the, uh, well, as, as Sarah said, uh, uh, the ethnography eh, of water that you are trying to <laughs> develop in uh, your artworks is um, uh, reveals the different languages of water. The, maybe some people are more um, uh, sensitive to some languages rather than others. But uh, what is important is to try to uh, emphasize these uh, different uh, languages of water, like uh, the holy wells, like sacred waters. Today we have lost, unfortunately, these, these perceptions. But there are also some uh, uh, books of uh, anthropology, ethnography, which gives a lot of details about uh, perceptions that we have lost. So this kind of work is absolutely uh, precious, and I. 
And what we are trying to do is when, when we get funds, because unfortunately it's always <laughs> no, but, yeah. the, the same challenge is to try also to give expressions to these new, um, uh, yes, to, um, expressions to ancient perceptions through uh, new art languages as well. So it was just a, a remark on what you on what you said and uh, what you have as shown today, uh, really amazing work. Uh, congratulations. Oh, thank and, uh, you. Thank you. And, and by the way, um, uh, uh, Sarah, we should try to invite... Uh, uh, um, Michelle. Sorry. No, I, I forgot. Uh, uh, Basia, Basia. Oh, Basia, yeah, to do a talk no. as well. Yeah, uh, Basia. Uh, Michelle knows Bas, Basia Erland. The problem is the time difference for Basia. <laughs> okay. <laughs> She yeah. is 11 hours behind India, so I don't know what time we're looking for her. Yeah, and also yeah. concerning the Water Museum of Ireland. Uh, mm -hmm. that, um... Michelle knows, um, Michelle, you, oh. you met Deirdre, right? Or I did reach out to them. Um, that was a while ago when, when through yourself and through Bazi, I think, but through yourself mainly, Sarah, yeah, I did reach out to them. Um, but I haven't actually heard. I did follow up, so I might just re-follow up with them again and see. But I'm not sure how active it is at the moment. I know it was. It seems to be maybe in process, but um, but certainly it it's something uh, I'd follow up on again. Yes. It is in process, but exactly because it is in process, is maybe the right moment also to yes, get in touch. Right. You can also put uh, Sarah and me in copy because they 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 are developing the concept yeah. of the museum. So, um, in a sense, uh, I think um, they uh, could be very interested to right? this, this approach on the different languages of water, also yes. from uh, different parts of the world. So they don't. They, they, they want to stick on the Irish heritage, but at the same time, looking eh, into different, uh, let's say, uh, ethnographies of, of water. So uh, your perspective, I think, could be also incorporated in the yeah. concept of, of um, some exhibitions in, in the museum, but at least inspiring or trying to... Yeah, to work in cooperation. Uh, I will. I thank you. I will follow. I will follow that up. Actually, mm. that's another thing I have to do. I'll add that to my list. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so one last thing, uh, Erberto, you forgot to mention, but the the uh, water we want competition that the global net network runs every year, Michelle, and it's yes. because the last slide where you had children painting, drawing on uh, around water, and those. Yes. Uh, Vessel, I mean, those different containers of uh, with water. So the water we want will, will be an announcing the next round soon, right, Roberto? Yeah. Yes, oh, but uh, okay. yeah. So in case you are also uh, working with uh, children and schools, that could could also be uh, a tool, right, to to convey some messages. But, Absolutely. Uh, when yes. when what is the what is the date or when is the call out for that? Well, the, the, the call is. Going to, yeah, Erbeto, you go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in next Monday, so the deadline is in April twenty four, I think uh, April twenty four, and um, yes. Yeah, so in case you are already working with uh, with the schools uh, and kids, uh, it could be um, yeah. Uh, a good way to develop some projects together. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at. I, I've been asked to sort of work with a, a not work, but contribute uh, creatively to. There's a very large river near where I live, the Boyne. It's one of the major rivers of Ireland. But looking at different projects along there, and that could be really interesting because it would be seen, sort of like the Ganges, the Ganga, sort of as a very significant uh, river that's full full of stories and belief systems. And that could be a really interesting one to be in, to be involved, to collaborate with a group that are actually working there on that, to send mm. that invitation out to them. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you, that'd be great. Yeah, and concerning sacred waters, con concerning holy waters, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a huge, it's a huge field of, I mean, that you can explore through arts, right? Since uh, many parts of the world, we, religion is not, felt so much as let's say in the past oh, absolutely. Apart from, I mean, absolutely. Apart from, yeah, yeah apart from religion um yes we we should look at uh, 
um, uh, individuals' involvement, uh, individual increasing the awareness and the perception of uh, of water. So this also could be a way of, uh, you know, make, making younger generation more curious about water because it's possible to convey some messages that are not the the usual ones. And so art I think is, is I mean I think water. that Alandra, even by putting water, even by mm -hmm. putting water in a little bottle like that, and there's a story to it, it's incredible how people look at the water differently when they see it. Yeah. When they see it and they can hold it and they can and even the waters like people were smelling the water. Like this water mm -hmm. is from a bog in Ireland. This water is from um a rock pool you know, mm. a very old rock pool where people would have blessed themselves and it was called a cursing stone. So you could you could you could wish somebody well, you could make a wish, but you could also curse them. <laughs> <laughs> you could also send badness their way. So it's not all it's not all um love and light, but uh, yeah. but it's it's yeah. you know the, 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 the and people still collect this water. People still collect this water mm. for those reasons. But absolutely, so that, I'm, I'm fascinated yeah. about the about just that. to give you an, an idea that uh, in the global network of water museums, there are not only institutions but also some communities. One of the last uh, members that joined from uh, Australia is a, is a, is a, an Aboriginal community uh, that is trying to uh, build, uh, let's say, a museum, <laughs> open air kind of open open museum related to the concept of uh, their ancestors to, towards the river and towards the water. It's a sacred river, of course. Eh? It's, <laughs> it's the, to, to, today it's called the Fitzoy River, but in the past it was the Martuvara, if I pronounce it correctly. So also through our network, there are possible ways, you know, to maybe to engage with the specific communities or projects that like is one in Ireland that we mentioned is more, I think, a kind of, uh, a traditional museum, but there are also communities uh, that are trying to make it visible, such 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 an invisible uh, link with uh, water and uh, and uh, the, the let's say the, the world view of, of these communities is uh, is really important to us. Yeah. Uh, they, they should be better understood. They should be uh, not only understood but uh, communicated and, and promoted and. Often, I think we need uh, the, the experience and the, the talent and the, uh, you know of artists to to to, to express uh, <laughs> truly what uh, the, the the richness of the language of water. Yeah. 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 No, I, I'm with you on all of that. I, I'm with you on all I of think, that. And yeah. Thank you for those things. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think we need to close soon. I'm going to hand over to Mansi, but. Just to say in closing, Michelle, that the indigenous communities and voices of the marginalized and poor is something we have been thinking about because apart from um, the Australian museum that Eriberto mentioned, we also work with indigenous communities in North um, um, America and Canada and America. They're both, uh, they're both there in the global network. And I would encourage you to also join that global net network of water museums as an individual. And yeah, we, we'd love to kind of work with you and see how we can think of some collaborative projects. Also, the India Island connection, obviously, when you're here, uh, Michelle is traveling to India next week. And Mansi, she may come to Ahmedabad. I don't know. Oh, that's <laughs> interesting. <laughs> There's a few yeah. people I'd so, love to uh, Let yeah. me find out. Let me find out if Michelle is uh, coming next week to Ahmedabad because I'm there next week. Uh, or, next uh, week, but right? she's coming to India next I'm week. I'm coming. I'm coming to yeah. I'll be. I'm coming to India for about three or four weeks, and what I'm hoping to do is set up projects for next year because really I have a lot of catching up to do in India, and I feel I feel it's the place I need to be into the future. Um, you know, my my last child is in college. I have more time, and it's it's just so rich and I've such a welcome and I've so I've friends there places to stay and I'm looking forward to meeting Sarah next week or the week after <laughs> so, and so I, I, feel it's, I feel it's in my heart I feel it's my home um and I just have to uh open myself to it and and let and take me on this exciting journey great thank you so much yeah thanks uh thank you uh Sarah and Sukrit and the whole living what uh, museum team to uh, really come out with this idea and host this session with us at W4W and uh, definitely a big thanks to Michelle to agree uh, to do this session with us. I still remember the first email which came to us 
and when you were writing and uh, apology that I, the response came a bit late from my end because I couldn't understand uh, whether I should respond or not uh, because of many spams which come into our emails. So I had to Google you before I responded to you. So I will be very honest on that. But it was definitely worth a wait for us to, us to have you here on this session. So I thank Sarah again to really uh, take this decision to really host Water Arts with us because we have been having wonderful speakers since she's hosting the session. And Michelle, your presentation definitely was way too deep to really still sink in into the head and starting from your own uh, life and then coming to the understanding of linking it with water. So thanks a lot uh, to you and definitely thanks to all the participants who have been here uh, for this session. I'm sure you have enjoyed this conversation and all the YouTube participants. I see quite a lot of people out there right now. So thanks a and, lot and for can, uh, being Can I just say, Nancy, if there are... Sure. If, so, sorry to interrupt you. Sorry to interrupt sure, you. Sure. If there are people who are in the group here who didn't ask questions, but who would like to ask or are curious about anything or even to more, even more so if they have any advice or they want to tell me about their own practice, <clears throat> I'd really love to make connections with people in India, artists and scientists, whoever else is in the chat um, or outside of India. Um, absolutely. To know what other people are doing, because I think that with uh, a community and with collaboration, you really do make fantastic mm -hmm. connections. Um, so please, my email so or my you website. Write your, um, e email in the chat box just now. So if people want as a start. Yes. yes. Mail yes. I think wonderful. And also uh, because now you have you have uh, been one of our speaker of this series, you will also get access to some of the wonderful water warriors in that country, nearly 300 of them who have come on our platform and spoken on different aspects of water in different mediums. So that access anyway you will get. So you can also start building your own water connection in India. Uh, so that is something which comes as, you know, as a complimentary to be our speaker in this session. So I think that will be after this. And I'm also so delighted to learn that you have an architecture background. So I'm sure I'm going to promote <laughs> you on that as well. Uh, but uh, for oh, but the I wasn't time, passionate. I, I never had passion, you see, about architecture. That was my fault. That was my problem. Yes, same here. We share the same, uh, uh, you know, path on this. And I'm going to talk to you about it outside this session yeah. and uh, how water became life. Uh, yeah. So uh, thank you so much, um, you know, all the participants uh, today on the Zoom you. and on YouTube and all the participants so far in more than 200 sessions which we have conducted on Water Talks. We are really grateful for your support and encouragement to make these conversations meaningful for us. So do keep joining us for all the Fridays. And next Friday, we have uh, Water Talkies. And after that, we have Water Book Club and then Thesis Club. And then again comes the Water uh, Arts, which is the fourth week of every month when we um, get Sara Living Waters Museum and Sukri to host the session. But apart from that, our main uh, signature series is Wetness Days for Water. And on first week of uh, November, we are, uh, which is uh, this time it is first November, do join us for the Lake Pond series, and which is the eighth, part, eighth session of the series. And this time we are having a, a water warrior from Indore who is talking about reimagining India's water bodies. And he has cleaned many lakes with his, you know, as, as a first-hand experience he's going to share. We really thank you for your support and encouragement to make the water conversations meaningful. Do take care of yourself and do keep us posted about your water worries and wisdom and do keep joining us. We see each other again and again. Thank you so much, all of you. Please take care. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you.